today that God is for you. He's not against you. He's on your side. He is calling out your name. He's singing songs over you. He is happy about you. He lives on the inside of you. He has your future mapped out, and he's going to help you get there. Oh, thank you, Lord. He's got angels assigned to you. He's got a covenant that covers you. You've got a Lord Jesus that is your intercessor. Oh, thank you, Lord. A high priest. Glory to God. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm so glad that I'm a born-again Christian. I'm so glad that I'm a spirit-filled Christian. I'm so glad that I'm a blood-bought Christian. Aren't you? Anybody with me? Anybody happy that you got out of bed this morning? Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy, too, that right over here is Sam and Kate Baggett, our very, very good friends of this ministry that have stood, from, uh, stood with us from day one. Praise the Lord. I love it when you all can come visit. God bless you. It's good to see you today. But even when they're not with us in person, they are with us in prayer and support, and they've been on our side from the very beginning. So I say it is good to see you guys today. God bless you. Well, I'm so glad I got out of bed this morning. Aren't you? I got up on the victory side. I got, got up knowing that God loves me. He's for me. I'm the apple of his eye. He was up all night thinking about me. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm so glad that I'm in this church. I tell you what, if I, even if I wasn't pastor of this church, I'd come to this church. Yes, I would. There's stuff going on in this church. I like it. There's stuff going on. I'm telling you, Sunday, uh, we're, we teach Sunday. We teach on Tuesdays. We teach on Wednesdays. We have prayer on Thursdays. We're in, the, we're in the nursing homes every week. We're in the prison every week. We're in the jail every week. We're on the highways, the byways. We're feeding folks. We're clothing folks. We're helping folks. We're out there witnessing the folks. Oh, I'm so glad that I'm in this church. I'm so glad that we're building more buildings for our kids. I'm telling you, the drawings are on the drawing board. We're getting ready. Somebody say, break ground. Somebody say, break ground. We're getting ready. We're going to build a, a, a building for our little ones. We're going to build a building for our teens. And this is what I told the teens. I said, if you'll just do this for me, outgrow this building so I can build you a gymnasium. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I tell you, it's going on. We got it. Turn to somebody and say, you got it going on. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, can you pull on the anointing for a few minutes? Have you got your Bibles with you? Hold them up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I will never, never, never. Doubt this word, because it is the word of God. I have ears to hear and a heart to receive, so teach to me the word of God. Amen and amen. Turn with me to John chapter 6, verse 27. We've been teaching a series on the work of the Father. Jesus said in Luke 2 and 49, he said, I must be busy about my father's business. He said that when he was 12 years old. You know, when you're 12 years old and you know what you must be doing, what you must be, Jesus said, I must be busy about my father's business. I think that is a magnificent thing. Jesus spoke in terms of emphatic statements. He had declaration upon his lips all the time. He, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't a fellow of maybes. He was a fellow of I must. I must be about my father's business. And when you look at the I must through scriptures, they're very revealing what Jesus must be about. I must be about my father's business. I think sometimes in the church, we've got our maybes and our musts all mixed up. Yeah, because too very often we're saying, well, maybe I'll get around to that. I might do that. Maybe I'll go to church. Maybe I'll tithe. Maybe I'll read the word. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe, 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 maybe. Hey, listen, if once we get our musts, once we get our maybes changed over to musts, that's when your life changes. That's when your life changes. You get your maybes turned into musts, and everything changes in your life. 
Well, in Luke chapter, I mean in John chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set His seal upon Him. Jesus had the seal of approval. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, good housekeeping seal of approval? Yeah, come on. Good house. Well, Jesus had the good Lord seal of approval. The good news is, so do you. Come on, church. You promised me you'd pull on the anointing. So do you. We're sealed with the Holy Ghost. I say just don't break the seal. Don't walk out from under the seal. Stay in the anointing. Hallelujah. For the Father's seal was set upon him. Verse 28, they said unto him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said, and this is our text verse, Jesus said, answered, said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him, in Jesus, whom he, the Father, sent. The work of God is that you believe. Your faith is the work of God. And that is the title of our message today. This completes our series on the work of the Father. And this, was, this one is simply entitled, Believing in Christ. That is the work of God. Believing in Christ. Look at verse 29 again. That's our text verse. You're going to want to underline it. You're going to want to highlight it. You're going to want to put a star beside it. You're going to want to put a sticker on top of it. You're going to want to know this verse. This is it. This is the work of God. That you believe in Him whom He sent. I believe if that's the work of Jesus, that is the work of the church. I believe if that's the work of Jesus... That is the work of the church as well. Come on, say amen. 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 Jesus said in uh, John 14 and 12, He said, Verily, verily, I say, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall you also do, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Jesus says, You're going to do the works that I do. Speaking of the church, You're going to do the works that I do, and greater works, because there's going to be a lot more of you than there was of one man, Jesus. There's going to be a, a worldwide church. Greater works shall you do, because I go to my Father. But He prefaced it. He said, You've got to believe on me. Verily, verily, I say, to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall you also do, and greater works than they. Listen, the work of the Father is your faith. The work of the Father is your belief. Come on, church, are you? That means you get out of the maybes and the mice, and you get into the I must. I must believe. I must have faith. I must stand on the word. I must pray. I must go to church. I must tithe. I must stand in faith. Come on, church, say amen. You get into that range of I must. That, that, I'm not going to debate it. I'm not going to waver. I'm not going to be so, so lukewarm, maybe so close enough. No, I must. I must stand on the Word. I must believe. I'm convinced. I'm convicted. I'm standing on the Word. Come on, church. Hallelujah. So Jesus said to His parents when they found Him at age 12, I must be busy about my Father's business. Now, the Father's business, of course, refers to the plan of redemption. And within the plan of redemption, we've seen a couple of things that speaks to the work of the Father. In John chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, we see that the work of the Father is the harvest. Jesus said unto them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Then he says, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are already white to harvest. We realize that the work of the Father is the end time harvest. And as the church, we are a part of that. Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe, I mean, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the age. That is the great commission. So the work, according to John chapter 4, is the harvest. Lift up your eyes. Everybody say, lift up your eyes. Up your eyes. Look on the fields. fields. We've got to get our eyes on the right things. Amen. And then in John chapter 9, Jesus talks about another aspect of the work. 
He said in John chapter 9, verse 4, I must works, work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, the night is coming. No one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground. He made clay. He anointed eyes. He anointed the eyes of the blind man. He said, go, wash. He went. He washed. He came back seen. So the work of the Father. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me. And when he did that, when he said that, he healed the blind man. So the works of the of the Father is healing. The works of the Father is the harvest. Amen. The works of the Father is healing. But now we see in John chapter 6 a crucial, maybe, maybe the summit point of the works of the Father. In John chapter 6, verse 29, our text verse, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom he sent. Now, that statement is the work of the Father is believing in Jesus. That is a gateway statement. That is where the door opens. Jesus said, I'm the door. That is a gateway statement. So when Jesus said, the work is believing, he's saying, this allows you entrance into a new life. And as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see that we're talking about a spiritual new life in Christ. He said, if you will believe in me, I will open a door, a new life unto you. Everybody say a new life. A new life. Now. Let's understand the, the context. The, uh, the chapter 6 of John is a long chapter. It's 70-something verses, and there's a lot going on there. And it begins with the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, way back in verse 1, Jesus fed the 5,000. And uh, indeed, it was probably 25,000 because it was 5,000 men. And you got to count the women. you got to count the children. And so he had mercy and compassion upon them. He taught them. And then he fed them. 5,000 people fed. And then they decided, because this was near the end of his ministry, they decided, let's make him a king. He discerned that they wanted to make him a king right then. And so he departed from them. He went up into a high mountain. He prayed. He sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. And while he was praying, he saw them struggling a couple of miles into the night, into their journey in the middle of the night. And so he came down from prayer and he walked across the water and met them in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. They saw him coming. They thought maybe this is the death angel. They thought they were going to die in the midst of the storm until he called out to them. They realized, oh, this is Jesus. And they willingly invited him into the boat. Wouldn't you? I would too. I'd say, Jesus, I've been waiting for you. Come on in. And as soon as he stepped in the boat, the boat was immediately translated to the other side of the sea. And morning came and everybody that he fed suddenly realized that Jesus is no longer there. The 5,000, the 25,000 realized, where is Jesus? Where is our meal ticket? They started looking around, and they said, well, maybe he's crossed over. And so they actually ran around the Sea of Galilee, and they found him on the other side. And that's where it picks up in John 6 and 26. Now, you've heard a lot of sermons on the feeding of the 5,000. You have not heard a lot of sermons on when Jesus refused to feed the 5,000. But here it is. Are you in John 6? And 26, if you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. Turn to your neighbor and say, hurry up. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs. And they saw signs. You can go all the way back to verse 2. There were signs and wonders. There were miracles. They had seen plenty of signs. They were even fed miraculously. They had seen signs. He said, but you seek me. You know, it's a good thing to seek the Lord. But you've got to have the right motive in seeking Him. Come on. Come on. We say, oh, it's great to seek the Lord. But the Bible says that, that there are many. Uh, it, says, it says you ask, but you don't receive because you ask amiss. Seeking to heap it upon your own lust. You've got to have the right motive when you're seeking God. 
And so Jesus says, yeah, you're seeking me. You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. What did they want? Lunch. That's what they wanted, lunch. They wanted the same thing that they had yesterday. Give me more than that. Give me the same as that. I, I, I want to eat again. And church, let me tell you, we've got to be so careful of our motives because a lot of people are seeking God as long as God is doing something for them. As long as it's good times, we're all happy about Jesus. But if it's a difficult time, where did Jesus go? I'm going to leave Jesus. No, no. He says, you're seeking me just because you want another meal. Verse 27 says, don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set His seal on Him. He's trying to get them to transition from a temporal way of thinking to an eternal way of thinking. We're so fixed on the temporal. We're so fixed on the moment. We're so fixed on how we feel. We're so fixed on the circumstance. And Jesus says, listen, if I give you another meal today, Today you're just going to want another meal tomorrow. But do you want eternal things? Do you want spiritual things? Listen, you've got to desire the bread of life more than the bread of lunch. Come on, church. Come on, church. Now, now, now I understand. I understand. We, we need food for our bodies because our bodies need fuel. But do you understand that you need food for your spirit as well? You need food for your vision. You need food for your calling. You need food for your purpose. You need food for your hopes in the Lord. You need food for your spirit. You need food for your mind. You need food for your heart. You need food for who you are in Christ. I, I know we need food for the body. Listen, I enjoy it as much as anybody. But we need food for our spirit as well, do we not? <laughs> Hallelujah. Is there anybody in the house? That would be honest enough to say, if I miss a meal, I get grumpy. <laughs> How about if you miss two? How about three? You're like a bear, fit to be tied, are you not? I tell you what, Debbie and I have been so busy lately. We've had a busy weekend. And there's just the two of us at home, and we don't, we don't eat a, a whole lot. But, but when we found ourselves so busy that we didn't get to the grocery store. And um, last night, I don't know if anybody's like me, but before I go to bed, I, I have to have a bowl of cereal. Anybody like me? I've got, it's got to be cold milk, and it's got to be uh, Kellogg's Mini Wheats. Not frosted. I, I'm not gluttonous now. I'm just talking about the plain Mini Wheats. Anybody with me? Now, if you're talking about Cinnamon Toast Crunch, oh, yeah, that's all. No, I'm... But I've got to have that cold milk. I've got to have that cereal. And it's got to be the, right before I go to bed. And, and it's just, I've got to have it or I can't go to bed. And so, and so I went to the refrigerator. And I opened up the refrigerator. And there is no milk. <coughs> Panic. <laughs> Panic set in. I start trembling. I go down the hall. Now it's like midnight now. There's, no, there's nothing open. And... and I go down the hall. I said, Debbie, Debbie, we, we, have, we have no milk in the refrigerator. I said, I cannot go to bed unless I have my cereal. And she said, then you're going to be up a long time. <laughs> this was my look. And then you know what she said to me? She said, hey, use coffee creamer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Coffee creamer for cereal? I looked. All we had was the dry kind of coffee creamer. I thought, Lord of mercy. Some help meet she's turned out to be, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody ever get grumpy missing a meal? 
Anybody get grumpy missing a spiritual meal? Yes. Come on, be honest. Yes. Anybody miss a prayer meeting and you get grumpy about it? Yes. Anybody miss church and you get grumpy about it? Yes. Anybody miss Bible study and get grumpy about it? Yes. Come on, usually we're like, we're missing church and it's like, yeah, vacation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, your spirit needs food. Yes. You need church. Yes, you do. You need church. You need prayer. You need Bible study. You need to be under the anointing. You need the Word of God in your ears and in your spirit. You need what God has to say. You need church. Sometimes I know, I know in the morning that alarm clock goes off and you think, oh Lord, if I could just sleep in, if I could just skip church today. If I, I, you, oh, I heard, I heard this story about the man. He, the alarm clock went off and his wife jumped out of bed and she got ready for church and got all dressed up and she came back and he wasn't up yet. In fact, he had pulled the covers up over his head and she said, honey, you get up. This is Sunday. It's church day. He says, I don't care. She says, no, you've got to get up. He says, I ain't going to do it. She says, really, you should get up. It's church day. He says, no, I'm going to sleep in today. She says, you can't sleep in. He says, give me one good reason why I can't sleep in. She said, you're the pastor of the church. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We need our prayer meetings. We need our church meetings. We need our Bible studies. We need time with Jesus. We need spiritual food more than we need natural food. I know you think you need natural food, but what you really need is eternal food. You need the, we need to think more about the eternal things than we do about the temporal things. We need to think more about the spiritual things than we do about the fleshly things. We need to think more about the Jesus things than we do our own things. Glory to God. Come on, say amen. amen. I said, come on, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You ever heard the athletes say, stay hungry? Stay hungry? That means you got to want it. You're working out. Working out's hard. You got to do it every day. You got to keep running. You got to keep lifting those weights. You got to keep exercising. You got to keep going through the routines. Why do you do it day in and day after? Because you're hungry. You're hungry for that gold medal or you're hungry for that new record or you're hungry for, for something, but you got to stay hungry. You've got to want it. Well, let me tell you, it's the same true in the spirit realm as it is in the athletic realm. You've got to want the things that God wants to get to you. You've got to say, like Paul said, I haven't yet attained, but I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You've got to want the things that God is desiring to get to you. Come on, church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse 29 of John 6, Jesus says, The work of God is to believe in Him whom He sent. To believe in Jesus whom the Father sent. Ah! So they say, Okay! What sign, if the work of God is to believe in you, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Are you kidding me? How did they have the audacity to say that? Are they crazy? Jesus had just fed them. Jesus had just won, done, done signs and wonders and miracles in their presence. He'd healed half of them. Cast devils out of the other half of them. He had done magnificent things with this group of people. And now they're asking for a sign. You know why they're asking for a sign? Because they still want lunch. <laughs> what sign do they want? Look in the next verse. Our fathers ate manna in heaven. They're right back to lunch. Our fathers may ate manna in heaven. As it is written, he gave them bread. From heaven to eat. They're saying, Jesus, why don't you call down some manna from heaven? They're thinking of Psalm 78. God rained down manna for them to eat and gave them the bread of heaven. Verse 25 of Psalm 78. Men ate angels' food, and he sent them food to the full. What did they want? They wanted to be filled. That, they were right back to give me lunch. Jesus had the perfect answer. He says, you want manna from heaven? That's me. I am the bread from heaven. In verse 32, same chapter, Assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life. Now, underline that. Gives life. That's very important. Gives life. Circle that because that's the point. The bread is to give life. Gives life to the world. In verse 34, they said, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 33. The bread of God gives life. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life. The bread of God gives life. The life that Jesus offers is through the Spirit. It's a new way of living. He's trying to transform their thinking to understand this from the temporal to the eternal, from the natural to the spirit. He's saying, listen, if you eat of this bread, you'll have spiritual life. It's a new life. It's an, it's an absolutely new life. Now, the apostle Paul picked up the, on this in uh, Romans chapter 8. And he says, listen, let me tell you what the spiritual life is. Now, you have to turn to Romans 8 and follow along with me because I'm going to give you 10 quick verses. And I'm just going to pop them off and you've got to write them down in your notes. But this is what Jesus has done for you to give you spiritual life. This is the kind of spiritual life you should be enjoying. So if you're at Romans 8, say, I'm there. 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 Romans 8 and we call this in Romans 8 chapter 2 we call this the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life we're talking about life in the spirit according to the law of God now a law is something that is always observed it is principles that are beyond negotiation it is what God abides by and it is the guidelines of your life it is the laws the principles by which the spirit operates in your life Romans chapter 8 verse 2 the law of the spirit of life okay number one this is the first law or the first key to understanding the spiritual life that you have in Christ. You have a, number one, you have a new standing or position and that new standing in Christ is no condemnation. Look in verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, what is condemnation? If you look it up in the dictionary, this is the definition. Condemnation, to express complete disapproval of, to sentence to a punishment, especially death, to force someone to endure something unpleasant. To officially declare to be unfit for use. To prove the guilt of. That's what condemnation is. But in Christ, you have a new life. You have a new standing. You have the life of the Spirit. And in the law of the life of the Spirit, there is no condemnation. So while the world is trying to tell you, we disapprove of you, God says, no, I approve of you. When the world's trying to say you're unfit for use, God says, let me use you. When the world is trying to pass judgment on you, God says, no, Jesus has already taken judgment. You are free. Whom the Son has set free is free in Hallelujah. So number one, you have a new standing. Number two, in this new life in the Spirit, you have a new mind. Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You don't have to be angry all the time. You don't have to be grumpy, frumpy, and bumpy all the time. You don't have to be sad and miserable. No, no, no. You can have peace. You can have joy. You can have, you can have love. Oh, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's two ways to think. Flesh-minded spiritually minded that's the mind of Christ so number one you have a new standing number two you have a new mind number three you have a new healing quickened by the spirit made alive by the spirit look in verse 11 if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies who dwells in you. Say, I'm healed. I'm healed. Say, I'm healed. I'm healed. Praise God. Number four. You have new direction. You're led by the Spirit in verse 14. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I thank God for a Holy Ghost GPS system to lead you and guide you. Number five, you have a new family. It's called the Spirit of Adoption, verse 15. For you did not receive the Spirit of Adoption, uh, again, of bondage again to fear, but you have received the Spirit of Adoption. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. Number six, you have a new prayer life. Intercession by the Spirit. In verse 26, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which not, cannot be uttered. I'm a firm believer that praying in the Spirit is one of the keys to success, to walking in the Spirit. I'm so glad it's shoes on the move. Fifteen ladies got full of the Holy Ghost. Fifteen ladies got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Evidence of speaking in other tongues. Number seven, a new calling filled with purpose. Verse 28, we know all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to His purpose. Number eight, you have a new image. Verse 29, He also conformed us to the image of His Son. Number nine, you have victory, a new victory. What shall we say to these things in verse 31? If God be for us, who can be against us? Number 10, you have a new prosperity. If God, in verse 32, if He did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give? Everybody say, freely give. Us all things. He wants to give you all things. And then finally in number 11, a new meaning to your life. In verse 37, it says, We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers or things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is given us in Christ Jesus a new meaning to life, a life of love, a life of unity with the Father. That's your new life. That's your new life. All that comes by the Spirit. Jesus said, if you'll eat of this bread, all of that is yours. But it comes by covenant. Now, let me close with this thought because this is a major revelation that you need to get. I'll let you read verses 51 through 58. But Jesus then begins speaking of, you must eat my flesh, you must drink my blood. And what he's talking about is a covenant revelation. We understand that today in the church because we take communion and we hold up the little bread and we say this is a sign and symbol of the body of Christ. And we hold up the cup of juice and we say this is a sign and symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we realize when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup that we are remembering the covenant that he made through the cross but for them they're still thinking about their stomach they're still thinking about lunch and they're thinking man we do not know what this guy is talking about he's talking about drinking blood and, and eating flesh it's too hard for us it's too hard for us and the saddest verse is found in John 6 and 66 from that time Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus looked at them and he says, does this offend you? He's trying to get them out of the temporal way of thinking. You know, there's many things in scripture that offends folks. That they say, I just can't go there. I just can't do that. You're asking too much. You expect too much, and they turn away from the Lord, and they walk away. And that's just the saddest thing. And then Jesus turned to his own 12 disciples, and he said in verse 67, Do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter stood up, and he finally got one right. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Because he, he messed a few up. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Church, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to walk away from the things of the Lord. There'll be plenty of occasions to be offended. But only through Christ do you have a new life in which He offers a new position, a new mind, a new healing, a new direction, a new family, a new prayer life, a new calling filled with purpose, a new image, a new victory, a new prosperity, and a new emphasis on love. Only through Christ all that is offered. And yet, sometimes people walk away. I would ask us this morning, where are we in that conversation with the Lord? Where are we in our understanding and priorities with God? When He says, I want you to quit concerning yourselves with eating the temporal and now start eating the spiritual. Where are you? in that conversation? Are you ready to say, yes, I hunger more for the spiritual things than I do for the natural things? That's the question that I pose to you today. And I do it because if you say, yes, I hunger and I thirst after the things of God, there's a new life that God has designed just for you. A life of calling, a life of purpose, a life of conformity to the image of Christ, a new prayer life, a new prosperity, a new peace, and a new love with the Father. That's what He desires to get to you today. Is that what you desire to have? If it is, say amen. amen. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Praise the Lord.